I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my everyday life living in Latin America. Some news that has just come out about Spain, about a new law for travelers that's going to impact you if you're going to be visiting Spain anytime in the, the upcoming time after October 1st has just come to light and is going into effect in just a few days, and it's something that people need to be aware about. So we're going to touch on that specifically, but I also want to touch on the broader subject of is Europe still the major travel destination uh, that we think of it having have been in the past. So we're going to dig into a little bit of that right after the bump. Europe is, in many ways, the remnants of the Roman Empire. This is not true for all of Europe, but it is true for the majority of it, and it may be worth picturing it in much the same way. And just like the Roman Empire, it did not fall in a day, but the decline and fall took place over nearly half a millennium. Similarly, if you were in Middle Earth, the elves slowly started moving back to their homelands once their time in Middle Earth had passed. And we may be seeing a very dramatic shift from Europe being the world's tourist destination to being a place a little less friendly and a little less attractive to tourists than it has been historically. I was speaking to one of my viewers who grew up in England, and recently we were just discussing how wonderful the culture, the uh, pub life, the food, the history, the uh, society, the television that England had in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s was, and how sad it is that we really don't have the same feeling about it anymore, and he made the comment that the England or the United Kingdom of our childhoods is gone, and there is no going home to it. It has fundamentally changed as a country. It doesn't have the same feel. It doesn't have the same behaviors, and while a lot of the same history is there, a lot of the same amazing buildings, the places that we used to see on television, and uh, for many of us who were not from the UK, but were looking at it from afar, dreamed of someday visiting, wanting to partake of that culture, is broadly gone. Of course, remnants of it will exist for a long time, but what we picture as idyllic England from the 1980s realistically doesn't exist anymore. And of course, we can blame the internet, we can blame uh, economics, we can blame, you know, cultural shift, the EU, the Brexit, whatever. But the reality is, is that the world changes and moves on, and some places are impacted more than others, and some places rise while others fall. And this is the normal ebb and flow of humanity, so it's not completely unexpected, but it is something you might want to be aware of for the people who are watching my channel. The majority of you are either simply interested in or looking forward to doing travel, and some of you are interested in or looking forward to becoming or expanding being expats and looking for places to live. And as someone who became an expat long ago and spent uh, more than anywhere else time in Europe looking for the right permanent home, of course I eventually ended up settling in Nicaragua in Latin America, uh, but I did really serious, uh, seriously consider Europe and did a lot of research visiting most of the countries, living in many of them, uh, and, and doing a strong survey, both as a backpacker, spending lots of time just touring around and actually living in several different countries. And before we get into that and talk about the decline and fall of Europe as a travel destination, I want to talk about this new rule going into effect in Spain on October 1st. So what's happening is there's a new data collection law where uh, anyone from like Airbnb and hotels, anyone who's dealing with customers in that way, has to collect a certain amount of customer data and not just collect it. And we're talking passports, identities, uh, financial data, bank record, not bank records, but bank account information credit card information, like actual copies of your credit card, and must send it to the Spanish government. This poses a lot of problems. A lot of people are confused. They seem to think it violates EU law. So they're collecting data they're not allowed to collect, but they're not allowed not to collect it. They're supposed to send it in, but a lot of places are complaining that they have no idea how to send it in. They don't have the technical capabilities to collect, protect, or transmit this data. So they're at a loss. They don't know what to do. This seems to favor large institutions and really hamper small mom and pops and Airbnbs and places that are a lot more uh, uh, locally based uh, instead of big European corporations. And of course, then we have the problem 
problem that it seems that data is being collected against people's permission by the Spanish government. And while the Spanish government is generally a pretty good one, any government that is collecting a bunch of data and holding it needs to be really, really good at that. And governments traditionally aren't very good at that. So this is a place where people are having data collected that is not okay to be collected, right? Identities and, and financial information can be used against you very easily. I mean, collected by a foreign state is easily a violation of uh, contractual obligations with like Visa. Like I doubt that Visa and MasterCard American Express vendors are allowed to send this information to the Spanish government. That doesn't seem legal under uh, contractual obligations that they have. Um, it doesn't seem legal that Spain is allowed to hold on to it under the way that the EU works. This basically flies in the face of all the EU privacy protections that they've been touting for years. They make you do all this stuff where you have to agree to cookies and you have the right to be forgotten. You have all these mechanisms that Europe touts as privacy so important. And now they've come right out and said, we don't believe in privacy at the highest level. We fundamentally don't believe in the EU concepts of privacy. So now there's a conflict in Europe that they are basically looking at being authoritative that on one hand, the side that wants to uh, protect privacy is bearing authoritative, being very authoritative about how they do that. You have to put up all these warnings even when you aren't collecting anything. You take on all this risk. They threaten companies around the world. They they're really operate like a mafia uh, and, and it's extortion is truly how they operate. And then on the other hand, those that don't want privacy are making laws that say you have to do these things and you can't operate as a business if you're not doing these things that violate some pretty basic ethics. And so you have this very authoritative stance in both directions, the only commonality is authoritative governments. So as a potential traveler looking at going to Spain, this is something you may want to be a little bit concerned about because no one knows how this is going to be collected, who's going to have it, and your financial data could be out there in a way that could be used. And that's potentially a very big risk, especially when traveling. You don't want your bank accounts compromised. So if you're going to be going to Europe, it is now recommended that you have single use or very specialty use uh, credit cards that you're able to isolate and keep them locked and only unlock when you're going to use them. Who knows how they plan on doing these things if they're using like Apple Pay or something like that. There's a lot of just unanswered questions for something going into effect so soon, but um, it does really denote an immense official stance against tourism, against privacy, and against consumer rights in the EU. So something to be aware of that this is, that the EU is allowing this, that Spain is enacting this, is a clear statement that the EU is not standing behind their concepts of privacy, which is fine. A lot of people thought that was overblown anyway, but they are also very directly going into an anti-tourism mode. Now that said, this is generally something we're seeing happen across Europe. Europeans are by and large, of course, there's pockets that are completely the opposite and there's pockets that are neutral, but by and large, Europe has been traditionally, and we'll talk about this, traditionally the vacation destination, the, the holiday destination, the backpacker destination, destination, all these things. It's so safe. It's been relatively inexpensive compared to North America for most of the last century. When we put these things together, it has been the place that when you say, I'm going on a foreign vacation, I'm going overseas, people expect you to be going to Europe. Of course, you could go somewhere else. But most of the time, it is Europe that you are going to. And as such, Europe has been overrun with tourists. And recently, we're seeing places like uh, Ibiza and Barcelona that have gone dramatically both from the populace being outspoken about not wanting tourists, but also enacting new rules to uh, curtail tourism, shut down the numbers, lower the amount of spaces that are available. And for good reasons, these are places that specifically one are Spain. So Spain has always been a huge travel destination. So they are impacted more than most places as that starts ramping back up. But these specific places within Spain are pockets of really high uh, tourism traffic to the point of being completely overrun and the uh, local economy basically gets wiped out. It becomes nothing but tourists. So the people who live there have nowhere to eat, nowhere to, to uh, get an apartment. Like they just can't because there's too many tourists. This has already happened to Santorini in Greece. The place is destroyed. It is one of the most beautiful physical places on earth and it is absolutely awful to go to. Not Venice awful, but really awful. There's no reason to go there. You can see 
everything that's beautiful about it in a photograph, and there is no redeeming qualities to it. The place is nothing but tourists eating bad food in overpriced uh, cookie cutter restaurants. There's no variety. There's no interest. There's no local culture. It is all fake at this point, and none of it is pleasant because there's so many tourists. You don't see it in most of the pictures, but the whole place is just people crammed in together trying to take a selfie and then moving on. Because there's nothing else to do. Selfies are actually saving the place. If it wasn't for the selfies, there would be no redeeming qualities whatsoever. At least you can get a selfie in a place that used to look cool, and mostly that still works. But they're afraid of becoming the next Santorini for good reason. They are on the path of becoming so, so it's legit in my mind. And so they are starting to take actions against that. But as someone who is looking at Europe in general, and Spain specifically, it is worth noting that Europe is taking a hard turn against tourism. They are feeling that they no longer have uh, the right to their own country or continent or culture or location, uh, which is a little bit of a cheek given that these are mostly the countries that colonized the rest of the world and didn't think anyone else should have those things. So there's a bit of, is it really appropriate for Europe to turn anyone away or act like tourism isn't okay? They don't really have the ethical ground to stand on. But remember, the people who live in Europe today are the great, great, great grandchildren of the colonizers in almost all cases, not the colonizers themselves. Uh, so there is a little bit of, they didn't do it, that, but they do reap the rewards of it. And Europe does have an obligation to the world to a lot of the resources that they have, which were pillaged from all over. So there's a gray area as to your opinion about it, but it is just something to be aware of. If you're going to be going to Europe, that your protections that you may think Europe is very protective of may now be one of the least protective places of. And if you want your data and your privacy to be secure, you may want to look more at Latin America, uh, Asia, Africa, and, and places like that, where they take your privacy and security a little bit more seriously. And that said, safety in Europe still remains very good. But of course, if you're watching the news, is nothing like it used to be. And that brings us back to the state of Europe in general. As a person who's been going to Europe and researching travel and life in Europe, because we were looking at becoming Europeans for a very long time, nearly 20 years now, uh, and, and have the right to and, and have access to and, and have applied for jobs and, and have worked there and lived there quite, quite extensively, uh, Europe has been very noticeably in a, I don't want to say decline necessarily, but in a very dramatic change. That's worth noting that the Europe that most of us grew up picturing, and even if you're pretty young, maybe Gen Z, uh, you may still picture Europe through the lens, the eyes of older generations for whom it was still that uh, mythical place. You're going to watch movies that are a few years old. You're watching, uh, you're just getting information from places like, oh, I want to go backpacking. Well, Europe, obviously, right? We still hear places like Greece and Spain and France and Italy, and instantly we conjure beautiful beaches and amazing places to go and all these sites and, and low cost. And while in some ways those things are still true, there are still beautiful sites. There are great places to go. There are great beaches. The cost isn't outrageously high. None of it is what it was. Um, and so the first thing I want to talk about is weather. So when I lived in Europe, it was still at the tail end of Europe being this mythically mild weather location. For most of its history, Europe has been ridiculously mild. It is so pleasant. If you're coming from North America and you go to Europe, you're like, oh, it's going to be hot. Nope, it's, it's perfect. Oh, it's going to be cold in the winter. Nope, it's perfect. Like it was always just nicer than other places. It was, it was really crazy just how nice it was. But starting in 2019, I happened to be there when the first of the epic heat waves came through in the summer. And we got to kind of trail along and watch the, the health alerts going off in our path ahead of us. And we just kept moving from place to place between 95 and 100 degrees. And Europe, unlike North America or Latin America, where these temperatures are normal, so we're not saying that, that Europe is becoming hotter than other places, but Europe has been built around their the communities have been designed around their, their society, their culture is all built around these really mild temperatures. The idea that you can wear fancy clothes and, and dress up and have a jacket and nice jeans and a hat and, you know, and, and actually dress up fancy and go out anytime walking and strolling and go to dinner and sit outside and never have air 
conditioning and everything is just beautiful. Sure, some days are warm, we're going to hit 80. Some days are cool, we're going to hit 40. But there's always just this beautiful mild in between. Now, of course, there's exceptions in Europe, Norway, for example. But most of the population of Europe had this just beautiful temperatures. And when we were there in, in 2019, suddenly everything was 95 to 100. Nobody has air conditioning. Nobody knows what to do. Nothing is set up for this. Restaurants aren't set up for it. Shopping isn't set up for it. Everyone's expecting the temperature to always be good. And when it's not, everything's falling apart. And so there, and, and buildings aren't built for central air. They're not built to have air conditioning added to them. There's all kinds of, you know, structural integrity laws. You can't just add air conditioning willy nilly. Some places, yeah, but not every place. And so, so much of the concept of Europe being so mild is starting to erode. And 2019 was dramatic because it was the first year of it being so bad. We had lived there for several years and it had always been absolutely beautiful. And there were no records of it being hot like this prior to that. Suddenly it was all of Europe and at temperatures no one was ready to accommodate. People were literally dying all over the place from the temperatures. I have videos on Take Flight with Scott where I'm showing the 99 degrees on the, on the pharmacy thermometer over my shoulder while we were in Rome. It was completely crazy and unprecedented. But since that time, that has become the standard. Now, I realize it's only been half a decade, but it is half a decade of consistently being much, much, much hotter in the summers than it was previously. And just all the weather is becoming more extreme. And so the idea of Europe having this idyllic temperature and climate all the time is already gone. That is a physical change that has wiped it out. Keep in mind that the Europe that we picture is basically post-war reconstruction Europe. As Americans or Canadians, we see Europe as our partners, for the most part, through World War II, and we were helping them rebuild throughout the 20th century. They were very far behind the U.S. and Canada and the U.K., you know, heavily occupied large portions of Europe uh, all throughout the century. There were a lot of changes going on. When you watch old media, you really get this sense of Europe having this grand past but struggling, current, but bright future. And that was the culture that we really got to know. Costs were very low. Uh, the, the, the continent was fragmented into these little pockets of very isolated living, and you could really explore this incredible diversity of cultures, which you still can, of course, and it's wonderful. But uh, the, the, the small town living, the, the lifestyles, the food, everything was so uh, quirky and unique and, and diverse and uh, safe. And you could go to these small villages and there was just this peasant lifestyle in so many places and, and old cities with old architecture. And now so much has changed. There's high rises all over and there's a homogenization of the culture and the EU, which is great for a lot of reasons, has brought all these uh, separate regions together as a single whole. And suddenly there's free movement for, throughout the region, which again is fantastic and creates so many opportunities, but also has commingled those cultures to such a degree that like we were saying with England, is the same throughout the continent, maybe trailing by a couple of years, but the old, for example, pub culture that made England what it is, is broadly gone and its equivalents throughout Europe have diminished greatly and continue to. And the old lifestyles, much based on the weather, of course, are starting to go away as well. And the desire for a lot of tourists has changed dramatically. Back in the 1950s through 1990s, right, there weren't that many North Americans looking to go to Europe. The cost of flights and the knowledge of what to do when you got there, all very difficult to come by. And so the number of tourists weren't that high and the world population was much smaller. Now, both Europe is a lot more densely packed than it was before, and North America and other regions have a lot more people to send there. And Europe does not have uh, this incredible lead in economy versus other regions, so, so more, more and more people are able to go there and spend money. But Europe has become more expensive as it starts moving into a more established economy, having reconstructed from World War II. And so we're seeing the cost of everything rise. And so while Europe was for a long time and still in pockets is a very low cost destination where, where Americans especially would go and spend lots of dollars to go really far because you could spend a month in Europe for the cost of two weeks in the United States, right? And so it was this uh, opportunity to go and experience a lot of cultures and you could afford to do it and it was very comfortable to do it and you don't have to worry about uh, a lot of things if you watch and I'm not recommending this silly movie but they talked about like Euro trip and they went there and, and they had just you know scraping together spare change and they were able to go out to a hotel and get a big dinner because things were so cheap back then and that was not that long ago I realize it's more than 10 years it's probably more than 20 years but 
that was within our memory that those films were coming out and that was how we saw Europe at the time and of course that was an exaggerated thing by, by a great degree but it really is how North Americans viewed Europe that money would go really far and that is not the case anymore all those things have changed uh, Europe has had really heavy inflation and just the cost of living has gone way up and the culture has changed people work more and, and struggle more and so we're seeing this really big shift in weather, in culture, and in overall approach to tourism that what used to be an incredibly welcoming culture that wanted tourism everywhere now does not rely on tourism the same way, especially post-COVID since there was an opportunity to shift away for or a necessity to shift away from tourism. Many places around the world did that. And now that tourism is starting to return, we have a problem that many of those places do not have the same tourism infrastructure that they did before. They also don't have the same need for tourism that they had before. And many of them have realized, Nicaragua being a great example, where they realize that tourism, while it's a good thing and they want more of it, isn't something that they want to be dependent upon and not the best thing to create a strong economic base. It is a nice icing, but it is not a good cake. And so you need to have a solid economic cake on which to have that icing. Well, Europe has an incredibly good cake to the point where they're not sure they want to put up with having the icing. Nicaragua is still at a point where it wants that icing. But its cake is now in place, and so the culture is changing. Nicaragua is not going to bend over backwards in the way that it used to to try to get tourists. Now, they're happy if you come, but if you're not going to come or you're not going to be a good tourist, they're fine. If you don't come, they're, they don't need you to come. Uh, Europe is now at a point where they've moved from that point into they'd really, for the most part, rather you didn't. They're not going to absolutely bar you, but a lot of people would like to. But they're starting to realize that a lot of other places, like Japan, where they heavily limit tourists, they put in big visa limits and, and so on and so forth. And with that, they are uh, able to cut down on the number of tourists and expats who are able to heavily influence their culture. And that there's a lot of benefits to that. Of course, there's negatives as well. Japan's bigger problem is just a general decline in population. And now they have to figure out how they're going to tackle that. But Europe has got that going on as well. And this is a really big deal that Europe, a number of years ago, hard crossed the demographic horizon. And that means they are shrinking across the board. There are a few, again, pockets where you have uh, positive birth rates, but by and large, you're at a declining population all throughout Europe, with some places mostly in the middle, like Italy and Germany, having really dramatic declines in population. Uh, they're not just growing, they're actively shrinking, leaving houses empty, uh, a lack of future generations to take care of the existing generations to carry on the traditions and the culture, and they are beginning to panic about that quite heavily uh, and trying to find ways uh, to fix that. Of course, recalling diaspora is an important method that they are trying to use to encourage people who are of, especially like Italian descent, to come back to Italy. They really want to welcome them back, but this is difficult because they are at the same time, not as dramatically as Spain, but turning on the concept of tourism and not being happy that so many tourists are coming to visit, but some of those are ones who might stay and some of them are Italians from abroad. So it, it creates a double-edged sword, if you will, that yes, they do want to back off on tourists, but they also need a population increase and those often, not directly, go hand in hand. But the reason that I'm having this discussion is less because of Spain and no place in particular, but really that for those who are looking at travel, on one hand, it's still a wonderful continent to go visit, but don't expect to find Europe to be the Europe you're picturing. And if you watch Rick Steves from the early 2000s, which is an excellent show, and if you're going to Europe, I recommend you watch it, It'd be interesting to watch that and go have a juxtaposition of just what Europe looks like today in the same locations, how much it has changed, not just with new structures or new paint job, but fundamentally from a culture and approach to life and climatic perspective. I think you'll find that Europe, by and large, is a relatively different place. And what a lot of us romanticize, uh, which is both uh, a pun and a very good way to describe it, as to what Europe was, the things that drew us there, I think for many of us, yes, some of it's still there. The Rhine is still the Rhine. The old castles are still the old castles. The mixture of languages, the incredible variety of food, that stuff still exists. The Swiss mountains are still the most beautiful mountains you can imagine. But so many of the cultural things that made Europe so inviting 
are eroding rather quickly. And so like Rome or Middle Earth, we are seeing, which is based on Rome, so that's kind of two examples of the same thing, and all of this is on the remnants of Rome, we may be seeing a second decline in motion. And for me personally, having spent a lot of time in Europe and, and being very heavily into expat needs and travel and relocation and, and those kinds of aspects of life, to me, it feels as though Europe has already lost its place as the premier travel destination. It is no longer uh, a clear win leading whether it's you want food or great weather or activities. Uh, There's so many things that it, in my lifetime, it was so far and away the best at so many things. It was easy to say, I want to travel abroad. There's just, I don't need to go anywhere but Europe. It's got everything and it's so good. It's so safe. It's so cheap. It's so approachable. They love having tourists there. There's so much to do. It, why would you ever go anywhere else? And I think that, well, yeah, certainly if you have the time and, and, and energy and finances, certainly going to Europe is still fantastic. And there's certainly things that are unique. There's nowhere else it's going to have the, 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 bones of the Roman Empire sticking out of the earth all over in the way that Europe does um, of, of any empire, right? In that way, there's so many unique things about Europe that it's going to remain. But I think a lot of the pieces of the travel and relocation puzzle that Europe has held for literally generations, for many decades, the majority of a century, coming really close to an entire century, um, have really already shifted, whether to Latin America or to Southeast Asia, and, and there are certainly regions of Africa that have some potential to be up and coming. Are they there yet? I don't think so. But are they getting close? Very possibly, right? The Rwandas of the world um, may be, a Tanzania, right, may be offering a lot of really good uh, living scenarios where people who have been traditionally looking at Europe and saying, wow, you know, if I relocate to Europe, I could get this great advantage, that great advantage, I could live so well. And now they're saying, well, I may not be able to do the things I had hoped to do just a few years ago, and you start looking at a Rwanda, a Tanzania, and say, oh, even those places, which I would never have put on my short list, may be offering a level of safety, a cost of living, an ability to get resources that I thought had been limited to Europe and maybe are no longer available in Europe. Maybe you're going to find them there. Much more likely Latin America and, and Southeast Asia, um, and even possibly China or Japan, but those get a little bit more challenging for a lot of logistics reasons. Uh, but the Thailands, the Vietnams, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, there, there's a lot of regions with big populations and large land masses uh, to explore the Philippines. Of course, I can't forget them. And, uh, and of course, lots of smaller places, but big, big, big countries with lots to offer are out there and, and easily are giving, at very least, a serious run for your money, literally and figuratively, against Europe for just how good of a quality of life and the availability of resources and, and opportunities that may exist in those regions compared to, compared to Europe historically. And in some cases, you're looking at places that have a completely different look and feel. So to some degree, Europe is unique and, and everywhere is, and so if what you're looking for is that completely European feel, it'll be a struggle in some of those places. But my regular audience, now I just came back from Argentina, and there are multiple cities in Argentina that give you so much of a European feel that you could easily trick someone, as well as many parts of Mexico that do a really good job and may trick some people a little bit less uh, thoroughly, but will still easily uh, let you give get the impression that you are living in Europe and um, you may not have to go to Europe to get uh, what traditionally we think of as the European values, whether in travel or in a long-term place to live or retire. So thanks for joining me. Get down there, comments and questions. I wanna see them. If you could send in a video of your questions, that is fantastic. I love it when we get those. It takes me forever to edit them, so don't expect me to respond really quickly with them, but I do try to get them in because it's so cool connecting with you guys and connecting you guys to each other, right? Being able to put you guys on the show means that those who are watching get to connect with those who are asking or whatever in a completely different way. And I think it's fantastically important and valuable. So please do that. I really do appreciate it. And uh, as always, like and subscribe. We've got that new membership system. As always, don't feel obligated, but it is a cool way if you want to become a member and really do uh, a, a lot to help support the show. And if you just want to support us normally, we got that link right up there. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. It's like Patreon. That comes directly to us. That helps pay with the cameras and lenses and microphones and all the stuff that it takes to do the show, which is 
a lot. And I was just talking to Eric from Generic Expats today about his challenges with the incredibly high cost of editing and of computer equipment storage because he's recording so much more than he's posting and so his backlog is growing and becoming a real problem for him. So those are all things that uh, uh, he's hoping to to be able to address and uh, but just highlights the challenges we have making these kinds of shows. It's so easy to record so much and then be like we've got to get these things out and uh, yeah, it's all, uh, it's all a lot of work, but it is a passion, and uh, I think we all love doing it, and we love having you guys along for the ride. So, thanks for joining me. I'll see all of you tomorrow.